Thank you for tuning in to our project Oral Bites, a musical omakase. The term omakase is commonly used in Japanese cuisine and it translates to I will leave it up to you. Applying this concept, Ko will not only be presenting 15 new pieces by five prominent Singaporean composers, but we will also be working closely with these composers to create the best program for you, our listeners. Along with these new commissions are designs and videos by local designer and video director Melissa Lim. This project is supported by the National Arts Council. Each of these short pieces will draw inspiration from the different ethnic musical styles found in Singapore and expressed through the unique musical language of each of our collaborating composers. Instructions on when and what to do while listening to the music will be provided for a complete experience. However, this participation is purely at your own discretion. Please feel free to enjoy the music just the way you prefer it.
In this live stream, we'll be talking to Ko Chenzing. Calling in from New York City, Chenzing is currently pursuing her Masters of Composition at the Juilliard School. Her music draws from her training in both Chinese and Western music. It often straddles between being playfully engaging and also being pensive and emotive, reflecting her passionate enthusiasm in unifying colourful musical idioms. Welcome to the live stream, Chenzing. How are you? everyone, nice to see you guys. I'm really nice and <laughs> really pretty comfortable at my home. Mostly staying home because of the pandemic and yeah, trying to mm -hmm. attend school from home also. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, is there anything you would like to add to the introduction of yourself? Um, so I am now a second year master's student at the Juliet School and uh, I am currently uh, like preparing for a lot of academic uh, work that's expected of me, so I hope to find time to compose again. <laughs> yeah, that's mm. it. And it's been really, really great working with you through this whole project. Will you introduce briefly the, the three pieces that you wrote for us? 
Yeah, likewise, it's a huge pleasure to be able to meet all of you guys. It's my first time knowing you all. And uh, for my pieces of music, I wrote three works as uh, expected. And uh, these three are from different cultures. The first one is from the Indian culture. Uh, it's called uh, To Charm the Urban Snake. The second work is inspired by the Malay culture. It's called Song of the Chandrawasi. And lastly, it's uh, based on our own Chinese culture and it's called the Cloud Tumbling Jade Rabbit. So these three music are all very different and they showcase different personalities of the subject matter that I'm writing about. So very excited to have you guys play it and to share it with the world. Likewise, I must say, it's very challenging to play your pieces. So maybe you could tell us a little bit more about your creative process and what it is like. Yes, so I, I don't know how, how I found myself to be writing more and more difficult music over the years. I think I have become quite spoiled by my environment here because I always have access to great players and you know when you have access to great company and environment you want to do your best and you want to exhaust every possibility that you can get from these various individuals and amazing talents around and you guys are like the first time uh, that I'm working with a win ensemble so uh, of course I was very apprehensive at first because I've never written uh, a wind quartet of this nature before. It's very new to me. And so I was telling myself I shouldn't be writing difficult music for this because it's for myself as well. It's something that I'm not familiar with too much. And also, I don't know you guys too well yet in order to, to write the kind of music that I'm, I project to y'all to play. So what I did was just to just to uh, go about the usual process of writing, which is to find a concept and a topic that interests me first, uh, because I am a very uh, sensitive and uh, quite an emotional person in general. So I like to express uh, emotions in my music. And it's hard for me to just write without any inspiration in mind. You know, like some composers, they can just craft out a mode and then you just develop that over and over in different ways. That's also amazing. That's something that I really admire, but I don't see it in myself uh, after these eight, nine years of composing. I'm still a very uh, programmatic person. I still like to search for subjects that have expressive capabilities and subjects that can pull my heartstrings. So uh, I also believe that in that process, there's, there can also be abstract uh, ways of handling the music material, such as developing it and bringing it back later and so on. So the more craftier side of things. But I, I think that even in the most abstract music, you can find evocations of emotional attributes because the way we make sense of the world around us as humans is to first have an emotional reaction to something and then we break it down and analyze. So that's been the way I've, uh, that's the way that I've been using to approach my own music over the years. And I find that it really works for me and it, it makes me feel the most comfortable writing. So for this set of three pieces, uh, uh, these three pieces are very interesting for me because I usually don't consciously say, oh, I want to write something based on a certain culture. It's always about like whether there's a subject that I like and then I write. But now it's very, uh, now I'm facing a set of very clear paradigms that you guys have offered. And this is great because it really makes me explore my own identity as a Singaporean. So for the Indian and Malay cultures, these two cultures are what I'm the most unfamiliar with because uh, I'm more uh, oriented towards Chinese culture, both musically and personally. So for Indian culture, I uh, had to find a subject matter that I wanted to write about first before I even think about musical terms. Sorry, uh, my cat is digging. Oh, okay, bye-bye. So uh, yeah, so I already knew that I was interested in the snake charming traditions of India. So I listened, uh, to a whole range of uh, snake charming videos from India. I took a week to hear each of them because, you know, usually the snake charmer plays using the pungi. It's a really interesting uh, instrument that looks like the hulu si 
and it has a very nasal sound which I wanted to replicate using the muted trombone. So when I look at all these videos, I sort of get a rough idea of how the music can turn out to be. But this process is not to just merely imitate the styles of that culture or to steal, you know, or to just deliberately incorporate the best of their, their modes, for example. But it's more of me trying to absorb as much the essence of the culture as possible, like to delve in it spiritually as well uh, for a, 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 an extended period of time, like one week, I think it's a good time. And then when I start writing, I will turn off everything and like I will not revisit any of these videos and influences. And I will make sure that what I write is largely original and it's a more genuine reflection of what I have absorbed rather than trying to replicate and reproduce everything from the culture. Yeah, and then I feel like because I'm a free composer, I like to write without a, a fixed set of modes or rules or notes. So for me, I like to uh, liberate myself by, by seeing what I can do with the musical material I have and to churn them out using my own methods and as an extension of my own musical personality. So, yeah, so that's basically my creative process for every piece of music that's unfamiliar to me. So I will just take time to understand them first, yeah. But it's not in an academic way, like to read about them, to make sure that I got all the rhythms right of this. Like, for example, if I want to use Indian, Indian rhythms, I, I learned the Takadimi stuff. Like, it's not to, to, to work very hard in trying to learn as much as I can and to use it fully. But it's more like trying to get the sense. And then even if I don't, even if it ends up not sounding even close to the culture, uh, to people's ears, for example, to the more ex, um, to the more refined ears of experts, they might they might say that oh, this is nothing like our culture, you know, like why are you trying to do all this? But for me, it's the process that matters. So if even if you feel like it doesn't turn out to be Indian culture, for me, uh, I felt it when I was writing it. So it's fine even if you don't feel it, and even if you feel like it's subpar to the music that's already being written out there in that culture. I don't mind it at, at all because it was already a very, uh, very uh, inspiring uh, procedure for mm. me. And I guess that's how you actually find your own voice. Yeah, because despite being able to research like all the idiosyncrasies of the specific ethnicities or cultural music, you still get that influence and then put it in your own voice and you're not stealing ideas. I think that's the most important. Yeah, because a lot of composers, they go for, re they do a lot of research and then they just try to replicate what they've been listening to or what they see. Yeah, and then you're just like, oh, this is just another piece from this culture. It's nothing special. Yeah. Yeah, for me, personally, I gain satisfaction not by knowing that, oh, I've mastered this style or I, I am now able to teach a course on this just because I use it in my own music. I've internalized it with me and I am capable of now sharing with others. But for me, what makes me the most satisfied and contented is knowing that I tried my best to feel the atmosphere of the music and to show it in my own way and my own pictures and music. But the, I would have to say that the beginning of To Charm the Urban Snake, uh, I wrote it with the Pungi sound in mind. So the notes that came out also reflects a little bit of that flavor and which the audience can look out for. Uh, but then the rest of the piece, you don't really hear that anymore. <laughs> so yeah, that's one example. But thank you though very much. Yeah, yeah uh, and you, I think you brought some really good points. I think uh, Daniel as well, uh, in, in what both of you have just said, is this uh, discussion about uh, originality versus authenticity, right? So I think, you know, what you have done really, really well and very efficiently for me is uh, how everything translated and the colors and the sounds that you have written uh, really capture the different styles that you really intended. And I think it's, it's so efficient and the, the music is absolutely beautiful. Uh, it's challenging, but also it gives us such um, satisfaction to, to put everything together and to rehearse. 
uh, why don't you share a little bit uh, with us about, uh, I mean, we've heard about the urban snake already. Why don't you share a little bit about uh, your ideas behind the Trendrovasi as well as the uh, cloud tumbling jade rabbit? Okay, so because I wanted to find a connecting point between the three pieces, so since I already did one on the snake charming tradition, I thought, okay, maybe I write something on the tradition as well, since I, I was going along the tradition route. And then I was trying to find a, a Malay tradition that speaks to me. And previously, I've already written on Kuda Kepang, which is also a Malay ritual, uh, Islamic ritual, actually. And then I'm thinking, okay, what else fascinates me? But then again, I couldn't really find one that I, I felt inspired by, mostly because uh, for me, I might like, it's, it's more like I don't have the set of ears to appreciate the music that I found fascinating in order uh, enough to be able to write it in my music. So I decided maybe I go along the animal route and see if there is any animal in the Malay traditions that that I can write a piece on so that more people can know about it. Because usually when we think about Malay culture, like I think about the food first. And then I think about the ketupat and the ketupat. Eh, ketupat. Okay, sorry, I almost said it wrongly. And then uh, I also think about various things that are not animal-based. So it was hard trying to find an animal. So I also went about, this time I took longer, about one, two weeks trying to find, um, trying to go through the English translations of various old Malay texts and poetry and to see if they have any beautiful verses about certain animal that I don't know that I want to feature. And, and uh, fortunately, I found that there's a really beautiful poetry on the bird of paradise, which is a bird that I actually found in a lot of paintings, but I never knew it's called the bird of paradise, that its name is the Chandrawasi. And then they, they said great things about the bird, you know, how, how uh, heavenly it is and how sacred and divine and how it only goes, how it only resides in heaven. And the fact that if it's near the ground, that means it's going to die because, because uh, it never comes to the ground because we are too corrupted for these pure creatures. So uh, I felt quite touched by the description alone. So I was like, okay, I have to write a piece on this and to express that kind of mournfulness in the bird's voice. But I won't give too much away. Maybe you might not find it in the music, so I don't want to prescribe it to you. So, but for me, I wanted to express the uh, perspective from the bird itself. So then I wrote a piece on that and I'm glad it worked. But previously, I also looked at maybe Puranakan music and also... Um, other Malay stories, like the story about the girl and the goldfish, which, which I think another Singaporean composer, Shafika, has already uh, written in, the, in her work for SSO, which was a wonderful piece. So I was like, oh, no, I'm not going to <laughs> do what she did. She obviously already did it well. So I, I, I went on my own way. And then for the final piece, oh, yeah, back to Malay music, because I find that Malay music is very enigmatic to me. Like some kind, sometimes the Malay music, they are very melodious, sometimes they are upbeat, but they don't really have a fixed mode that they follow. So it was hard for me to like try to listen to their music and then I couldn't find any connecting trends that, uh, that are very recognizable on the spot. So I decided, okay, I'm not going to put any musical influence from the Malay culture and just write what I feel. So that piece is very, uh, very freely written, very through composed. Uh, and it really reflects my personal voice. And as for the third piece, the Cloud Tumbling J Rabbit, uh, I took the shortest time writing it and the shortest time coming up with the topic for it uh, because it is Chinese culture. So I already knew what was interesting in Chinese culture. I mean, there's the Nian, which is the Chinese New Year creature. And then there's, um, there's the uh, lion dance. And then there's, the, there's also like food, mooncake and all that. And even Chang'e, the goddess. And then I was thinking, uh, what about the rabbit next to Chang'e, which is not really featured at all in, any, in a lot of art, for example. So I certainly haven't came across a piece that has the rabbit as the theme, as the, the jade rabbit as the theme of the music. So I thought maybe I should write a work based on it. And then I thought about maybe the rabbit is having fun uh, on the moon and tumbling everywhere because we know the rabbit as uh, a very sacred creature that 
uh, that keeps the goddess company and also uh, makes a lot of elixirs, uh, the longevity, longevity elixirs, so that the goddess will never perish, her beauty will never fade. So I, I thought that that's the lofty mission of the rabbit. But what about giving it a more enjoyable and fun personality, more comical? So I decided to write a fun piece that, that challenges all of you guys <laughs> in everything as usual. And, uh, but uh, it's supposed to be more, uh, more amusing in general. I hope you guys also found it fun <laughs> to, to, yeah. to play, to rehearse. Yeah, yeah so that, definitely. All. Yeah, I, and I think your, the, the intentions that, that you wrote, straight away, I think when we rehearsed the music, we understood the concepts and the idea and uh, the story behind it. Uh, yeah, particularly uh, in, in the Chantra Wasi, I, can, I speak for myself, you know, uh, the, the mournfulness and the beauty of the melody and the textures of the, the multiphonics from all the this, this in, uh, different instruments are really um, it quite very, very lovely mix. Yeah. And uh, of course, when it comes to the, the Jade Rabbit, I'm sure for you on the Yang Ching, it's a walk in a park when you do all the running notes for you, it's going to be, we're not going to put you on the spot. I'm not going to ask you to play it now, of course. Uh, but <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure um, uh, it's uh, not a problem for you, right? When it comes to like uh, playing that uh, on, on the young team. And yeah, and I think, you know, practice, yeah. you know <laughs> I'm yeah. not like some expert. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, so I think, uh, I mean, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for uh, all the music uh, that, that you've written for us, really. And yeah, I think you've really uh, pushed us in many different ways, individually and uh, as an ensemble. I think uh, I, I speak for myself um, in, in terms of the, the range that you've written for, for the instrument. It's, it's really the, the full spectrum. Uh, yeah, and uh, I wish I could do a little bit more for you, but uh, I top out at some point. Yeah, so yeah. No, and, you guys but, were amazing already. Yeah. Really, I, I had fun listening to you. I really enjoyed all your playing, and yeah. it's better than I ever imagined. Yeah. yeah, I can't wait to watch one of your concerts in person one day. Yeah, I mean, to tell you guys how much I, I enjoyed you. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it, it, we are all sort of like looking forward to the day that we can uh, play again, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. so. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, th uh, thank you so much, and yeah, it's been it's been a great challenge. And I think uh, maybe um, Mish, yeah, what are some of the challenges that that you faced during during this time? I think especially in the last piece, right, is the rabbit, and it's so you know jumping around, and then you hear it in the music as well with with these like huge leaps of uh, the interval jumps, and like putting it together with uh, Daniel, <laughs> I think we found very very exciting. The, the preparation. Yeah. I was the tumbling rabbit. I was tumbling everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Chasing the clouds, which is Mish. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm happy to know that you all have found your place in the music. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, really. I know it's not easy at all. And I feel yeah. that to put, in, to put them together in such a short time is really crazy. It's yeah, really... we we were also really shocked by our timeline. Yeah, because initially we thought it was possible, and then when we got all the pieces, we we're like, oh, "What did we set ourselves up for?" Yeah, yeah. So like you you were mentioning, you've never written for such an ensemble before. So what were some of the challenges that you faced when you were first approached by us to write these three pieces? So out of you guys, right, the only instrument I've written for, like in chamber setting, is the clarinet. So I have not touched any of the rest of the instruments, certainly not the euphonium at all, because uh, it's just rare to find a good euphonium player these days that are not from, that are not from bands, you know, but I like the real, the soloistic uh, euphonist. You, you didn't call yourself a euphonist. <laughs> <laughs> that just came up. <laughs> a euphonium player. Okay. So, uh, what was I going to say? Uh, yeah, so, of course, it was very hard because of I was so um, new to everything. I'm not a wind player. I'm a string player and I'm a dulcimer player and a pianist, a, a wannabe pianist. So, I'm not really a uh, huge, like, uh, I'm a huge fan of wind, listening to wind music also for prolonged periods of time. 
but then over the years, I found that I have been able to to absorb like the special and the unique colors of each of the wind instruments, and I also found that because the nature of all your instruments are like very melodious and all very soloistic, and the tessitura are all overlapped, so there's no uh, certainty into saying like okay, one instrument will must should be the melody most of the time, you know, the other should right. I feel like now everyone is able to like. To to to, uh, to challenge the hierarchy of melody versus accompaniment, for example. So, for me, that was the hard because there were so many options to choose from, and uh, I had the hardest time starting the music because I was like, okay, which instrument should I start with? And then I convinced myself and resolved this problem by. Uh, telling myself that I should just treat it as a normal piece of music that I'm going to write regardless of the instrumentation and still do my best to write good quality music and because the instrumentation is just going to enhance that part of it. So I paid more attention to the individual colors of all your instruments. I listened to a lot of solo euphonium especially that I, I didn't know much about the euphonium the most of all. So I listened to more euphonium than the rest and then I tried to internalize all your sounds in me and then as I wrote, I was able to designate roles to each of you guys. So sometimes like two people would be the, the one in the foreground and then sometimes like you have the trombone rising above everyone else. So I wanted to feature everyone in, a, uh, in an equal manner so that there's no single instrument that's being left out or being relegated to the accompaniment part all the time. That would be very boring, I think, for the player. So I wanted you guys to mix around and make use of your wonderfully overlapping uh, ranges and voices and to make you guys homogeneous sometimes and at times make you guys distinct from each other. So that was one way of resolving it. I'm sure there are many that I haven't found yet. And then I think yeah. about other harder parts. I think that's the hardest part I, I have to say. So probably this, the rest should be fine. Yeah. And also with your choice of instruments, you decided to write for the alto trombone and also the alto clarinet. Like how, how, how did this come about? <laughs> I mean, I know we gave you the option too. Yeah, it was really great to have so many options. I know I also could choose the easier route to have you guys play on the same instruments for all three pieces so that you know you guys can maybe carry it wherever you go or you don't have to find like instruments or to readapt to all the instruments you know for every piece uh, but i also wanted to take advantage of all the instruments that you guys have except the baritone saxophone which i haven't touched yet so next time solo for you so uh, for that matter i for the first piece i i did auto for everything like you said uh, that was deliberate because I never touched an auto instrument in my life and I wanted to see what I could do with it. The auto clarinet is very unique to me and very refreshing because I feel like it is a great mix between the bass clarinet and the normal uh, clarinet. And I think, wow, what a one wonderful way and what a wonderful instrument <laughs> to showcase because of the full range that it has. So that was the reason for auto clarinet. As for the auto trombone, it's because I wanted the trombone to go into the high range uh, to, to emulate the sound of the Indian instrument, the punghi, the pipe instrument. So I thought that the auto trombone is the best candidate. As for the auto saxophone, that just came uh, <laughs> because of these two choices and to see what I can do with all auto formation. And then as for euphonium, I'm, I'm sorry, that's only the euphonium. <laughs> I considered bass trumpet, but then I, I wanted, I felt like, I felt like I, it's rare for me to write for euphonium anyways. So might as well use it for all three pieces. Yeah. And I have such a great euphonium player too. I'm sure you are also stunning at the bass trumpet. So I can't wait to see what, what I can do next time. You're way too kind. You're way too kind. I'm not so sure. I, don't know. <laughs> I can lead up to, yeah, your... Your uh, such high high praise, yeah. No but pressure, Vincent. Oh no, not, not at all. Not at all. <laughs> and I also but, have to really applaud you for writing for the alto clarinet. It is such an underutilized instrument, and it's also very often mis like, like 
there's a bad misconception to how nasal the instrument is, you know, the colour. But it's such a beautiful colour to exploit as well. And yeah, it's rarely been written for, especially in such a chamber setting as well. Yeah, so I really... I really appreciate that you writing for the auto clarinet and thank you. I have you to for thank you very for challenging part. It. No, you are the one who demonstrated it to me, and I didn't even like know about this existence of this in the chamber repertoire. Like you are the one who enlightened me at the, the at our first session, and I have to thank you guys for really working hard on the music and also to Dawn for trying to find different mutes to fit the sound. So I really, really appreciate all the hard work behind this. Really, it, it means a lot. It's the reason why I could write something that's uh, answerable to myself. Thank you, guys. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, even, even for the alto trombone, like, yeah, like, it's, I think, like, it's not normally utilized in, chamber settings, right? So far, I think you can only find it in like uh, orchestra works, right? And even older orchestra works, not even the modern ones, right? So it's really underutilized. And also like, I think like the modern, in, in modern like compositions, I think only like trombone ensemble, big trombone ensemble really utilize the auto trombone. So I'm really grateful that you actually uh, thought of using it. And yeah, and, and like what Vincent said, you really do, do try to utilize the full range, right? Up to the high range, up to the, even the lowest note on the oh, really? seventh position. Yeah, it was, it was, it was really, really like, you, you, could, you could really tell that you really did research, did, did your homework on understanding the instruments. So thank you but so much for that. Oh, thank you. But nothing beats like working with you guys individually. Because every time I finish a work, I like to send to each of you individually and say, oh, could you help me check? And then anything too crazy or too overboard, please let me know I can control myself. And because of that, I was able to write like not just like decent music, but also music that is playable and with, to some extent, music that is uh, sensible for you guys. Yeah, so I really have to thank you all for showing me your instruments. And to Don also, he also actually sent me a lot of great trombone pieces and trombone recordings and trombone techniques for me to explore. And uh, especially in the second piece, like I never knew that the trombone could be so beautiful because every time I think of trombone, I think of the, the mellow sound, like the, the, the very uh, punctuative sound that it can have, the percussive sound, especially in the faster parts of the orchestral repertoire. But I never knew that the trombone could be so expressive uh, in terms of the using the vowels and using the leap and brochure. So I really learned about a lot about wing instruments because of writing off for you guys. So I really am thankful for this opportunity. Yeah. I think that's the most important thing I want to get across today. <laughs> mm, really? Yeah, with, with that, right, do you, do you have like any sort of vision or idea of how the audience can enjoy the three pieces? So I don't really expect the audience to concoct an entire scene of the animal that I've written, you know, <laughs> imagine the rabbit running around. <laughs> no, no need. I think it's more of a full body experience, like from the visuals to the ears, like to experience the music as it is, to enjoy it as much as you can, to be as embracing as possible and to not like shut, shut off after you hear a certain part that you find and. Uh, find uncomfortable perhaps because it's something very new like not to shut off immediately but to wait a little bit longer to see how it goes and to see if it brings you somewhere i think to have patience is very important in listening to newer kinds of music like what we are doing and i hope the audience just sit back and relax and just let the music speak rather than you trying so hard to grapple with it. I think that has a lot of stress and burden. So I would, I would prefer it if the audience can just treat it as any music that you are listening to and just uh, enjoy instead of coming with expectations. Yeah, thank you, Chen Xing. And with that, <laughs> I think we have to wrap up this session. <laughs> Thank you so much yeah. for having me. Yeah, really, thanks. Thank you for chatting with us. It's been really a whirl of a time working with you through these three pieces. Yeah. It really is, yeah. I, it's thank very you. memorable for me. Thank and you. to everyone else out there, thank you for tuning in to Oral Bites, uh, musical, musical Omakase. We look forward to seeing you at our next show. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you for tuning in to Oro Bites, a musical omakase. This project is generously supported by the Singapore National Arts Council. For more information, please find us on Facebook and Instagram. We are Ko Music, K O U M U S I K. Stay safe, and we hope to see you at our next show.